Hey everybody, it is Wednesday, June 7th, 2023. We welcome you to episode number 92 of Tone the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn. We talk pitching each and every week with the five-time World Series champ, the former Cy Young Award winner, David Cohn, the research master, James Smythe, and myself, Justin Shackle, our wonderful standout producer, Dan Work, with us as well. And we are uh, reacting to some of the Biggest pitching names in the game being in the news this week, but we're also going to be talking with Tanner Swanson. He is the quality control and catching coach for the New York Yankees. And we're going to be speaking to Tanner about the catching game intertwining with pitching throughout the majors. So even if you are not a Yankee fan, there is definitely something that you're going to be able to take away from Tanner's spot here with us and just how big of a focal point receiving has become at the catching position. David, how how appreciative do you think our pitchers toward all of this? I think they have to be very appreciative. And the catchers themselves, too. We've heard Jose Trevino, when he was on our podcast, talk about, boy, I wish some of these old school catchers could come and just watch us work and see what we're really doing behind the scenes. And that's a direct result of Tanner Swanson and his input and influence on the catchers. So, yes, I think uh, – there's much more emphasis on stealing strikes, framing uh, that, that the Yankees do exceptionally well and all the other nuances that are continuing to change and evolve. Uh, and catchers blocking for one thing is a big hot button catching uh, blocking and throwing are, are two things that old school catchers still knock about the style of today's catchers, the grounded knee as Tanner calls it. Uh, but he goes into detail. I mean, you could get the sense from Tanner that he could talk all day long about this stuff. He kind of started to, we had to cut him off a couple of times, right? Because he can really kind of go into depth and give you as much as you want. Uh, you know, he's a really smart guy, really hard worker and a guy that can back up his theories with numbers. Now we have a pretty large sample size of data that, that kind of proves what he's doing is, is paying dividends. It was an informative spot with Tanner. We're going to get to that interview in a few moments. We're also going to have a a quick Yankee chat near the end. But a a couple of items to uh, tackle here before we get to our chat with Tanner Swanson. And one does have to deal with with Aaron Judge. I mean, arguably, in the eyes of some, the best player in Major League Baseball. He's going on the injury list for a second time here in 2023. He has a, a sprained ligament in his right big toe stemming from the catch that he made at Dodger Stadium where the bullpen door flew open, but there is a there's a slab on the base of the wall. No pun intended there. Uh, concrete, you nubbed your toe. Probably, you know, th- think about stubbing your toe in the middle of the night on your bedpost and then multiply it by a million. I'm sure that's what Aaron Judge is going through here. But uh, as we start with the opener, uh, David, Judge going on the injury list a second time. We see the impact when Judge is out what it does to this Yankees team. Guys, what do you make of uh, of Judge being out, but more importantly, how the, the Yankees navigate without Aaron Judge? Wow, you, you you start to look at the AAA roster again, right? If he goes on the IL, you're an outfielder short. How do, how do they mix and match? When is Harrison Bader due back from the IL as well? How close is he? To me, that's the number one question. But maybe, do we see Franchi Cordero again? Is there going to be a, a, a return of Esteban Floreal? Potentially, he had to, there's there's some roster maneuvers that would have to be done for that. Um, a lot of people look at a strikeout rate. Florial's is that is that going to be something that that's a concern for the Yankees? It has been up to this point. So yeah, I mean, it's all hands on deck. All the depth pieces are, are being looked at everywhere, including outside the organization. It's almost impossible to make a trade nowadays of any substance because the draft's coming up and trade deadline still has some time to go before we get there. So. Yeah, it, it is a difficult uh, uh, situation right now. To me, first and foremost, a bit, run prevention comes to mind. Pitch better, allow fewer runs, because without Aaron Judge, you're going to score fewer runs. And the pitching has been better. The uh, The bullpen is still the best in the game. Uh, you're getting some reinforcements. Giancarlo Stanton is back. Josh Donaldson is back and has looked pretty good. So, you know, many hands make light work. It's not going to be one guy that – takes on all of Aaron judge's production, but if everyone else chips in, you can, you can help there. And the production, as you would guess uh, with and without judge um, a huge difference as, as you might guess, they were playing uh, better than 600 ball with judge this year and without him starting, uh, including the first game without him in this white Sox series, they are six and seven compared to 30 and 19, the runs per game goes down from about five runs a game to uh, a little under three and a half 
the average is lower, the slugging is lower, the homers per game is lower. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that Aaron Judge missing from the Yankees lineup is going to be a big absence. But at the same time, it is baseball. There's only so much impact one player can have. Yeah, when when he went on the injury list with the hip injury near the end of April, the offense was was already struggling. I mean, they were missing a, a ton of players, but that kind of just accentuated where the offense was at. And I had multiple Yankees tell me that when Judge was out in the immediate aftermath, you know, the first five to seven games, a, a lot of players were trying to do too much, maybe more than they were capable of. So just keep that in mind. I think that's an important message, even for the Stantons, the Donaldsons, who are you know are are just coming back. They're fresh. Uh, certainly Anthony Rizzo stay within yourself stay within your 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 abilities and and don't try and uh, make up for what you're losing with judge in that regard I think it's a you know a collective effort one through nine and I kind of equate it to maybe like an NBA rotation you know losing that key piece in the immediate aftermath you see like the the loss immediately it takes a good you know seven to ten games uh, in the NBA for that specific group of players to come together, gel, see what works, find out what fits. And then they kind of hit the ground running again in the aftermath of, of whatever it happens. Maybe it's a trade or a player leaving player going down here with judge uh, being out. I think, I think the main message here is because we've already seen it now this season, do not try and do more than what, you know, what you're capable of. You're not trying to lift a mountain here. Um, stay within yourself. And I think if, the the lineup collectively comes together and raises its game it's better than just that one that one person looking at it as a burden on on their own shoulders so uh going to be an interesting couple of weeks don't know exactly what the timetable is like for judge uh, it's obviously something we're going to be keeping our eye on uh here as we approach you know the i mean we're 62 games down uh nearing near the midway point already here in the baseball season. So uh, Judge hitting the injury list for a second time, not good for the Yankees. We'll see how they navigate this. Uh, Jacob deGrom was on the injury list for the better portion of a month and change. And on Tuesday, we learned that deGrom will be undergoing a second Tommy John surgery. So his season's over. He'll likely be missing a decent chunk of next season as well as he recovers from Tommy John. Uh, the talent with DeGrom is transcendent. We've discussed this countless times here. We've also watched him while kind of holding our breaths the last few seasons because of the injury history. My main question here in the wake of this news, guys, will we ever see peak Jacob DeGrom again? Well, he's such a freakishly good athlete. I would say the chances are probably yes. Uh, although this is his second Tommy John surgery, the warranty ran out on the first one, 2010. So that just to go to, that goes to show you that you think, Oh, let me get Tommy John surgery. I'm risk-free the rest of my career. That's not the case at all. There's been several pitchers, several over the last five to 10 years that have had another Tommy John surgery after having the first one. So um, I think next postseason, if he could shoot for that, for the Rangers who seem to be on the upswing, it's hugely disappointing, obviously, but yes, I think he can still make it back. He has such excellent control. He's a three pitch pitcher. I know we, we tend to think of Jacob deGrom as such the power guy, the guy who throws hundred miles an hour, the guy that throws so hard, can his body hold up, but he also has ex ex exquisite control too. He paints that outside corner to, to right. He's an inside to left. He's so well, he's got an outstanding slider and a changeup to go with it. So projecting in the future for me just in my own sort of uh educated guess kind of a kind of a way of going about it i would say yes and I, I think he will come back because he's he is a really good pitcher to go with that that power arsenal that he's so known for and generally speaking if there was a power guy you'd you that just relied solely on power you might question that jack you might say oh, i don't know maybe maybe he's gonna suffer a little power he doesn't really have the finesse to go with it. Jacob deGrom has always been the best combination of power and finesse in terms of his command. So my answer is yes, I think we will. For the Rangers' sake, maybe next postseason. He comes back and gives them a big boost in August or September down the stretch for them next year. I think we do, but the depressing thing to think about is that if, you know, if he does come back and he looks great, how long until the next injury? So will we, we – I think we will see that kind of pitcher again, but maybe it is just for spurts of six or eight starts at a time. It's a, uh, it's a shame, but pitching is very bad for your health. 
as as has been well documented here on Tone of the Slab. Um, I think I think we do. I think seeing what Justin Verlander has done the last couple of years uh, gives me hope because you could put DeGrom in the same category as, as Verlander in terms of raw talent and stuff. So even though he's in his mid thirties right now, I think there's room for a talent like DeGrom to come back in his late thirties and pitch to that high level. Um, so I'm, I'm holding out hope for that. And uh, we, we definitely wish Jacob DeGrom our best year uh, from a team aspect with the Rangers. And we take a look at this year only. Uh, does Texas have enough pitching now to be a title contender this season? I can't believe I'm even saying that. Like, you know, instead of deep playoff run, you know, a playoff contender. No, the way that the Rangers are performing here this season, we can automatically put them into that group. Are they a title contender? And do they have enough to carry them to a potential World Series appearance? Nathan Avaldi is probably the best offseason signing of any starting pitcher at or near the top. I would take him just about over anybody the way he's performed in terms of not only the way he's performed, but the depth he gives. You know, he's a threat to, to get really deep into the games in seven, eight. He's actually thrown a shutout, pitched nine innings a couple of times. So, yeah, Dane Dunning's been a surprise for them. Kind of maybe not a surprise if you're there and you've seen him work out of the bullpen and the rotation. Uh, he's been really good. Martin Perez, when he gets it going. Uh, is one of the best ground ball pitchers, you know, going uh, in, in the game today, always at the top or near the top in terms of ground ball, double plays and deuce. So yeah, John Gray, uh, another guy that's really under underrated, undervalued, a veteran guy from Colorado uh, seems to really enjoy pitching in Texas. So yeah, my, my answer is yes, that the, they've made a lot of good bets down there. Chris Young probably should be in consideration for the general manager of the year. Sometimes it's luck. With general managers, you make bets on free agents, on trades. They have made a lot of really good bets down there, including their middle infielders, and, and, and Simeon and, and Seager. I mean, wow. You know, just everywhere they turn, other than DeGrom so far, has, has been a hit. because They have won the bets they've made. So you got to give credit where credit's due, and that's right to the top. Ownership, allowing the resources to be, to be used, and Chris Young, one of the best young executives in the game. He deserves a lot of credit. Last year was the year to, to shore up the lineup and adding Seager and Simeon is about as good as it gets. And this year was when they needed to shore up the pitching staff. And the thing when we were talking about these guys as a possible sleeper team during the off season, it was the change to the pitching staff. Every game you were throwing out a representative big league pitcher, which is not something you could have said about this team for a long time. So even going into the year, DeGrom, Evaldi, Perez, Gray, Heaney, that's a good solid five. Even with DeGrom out now, Dane Dunning has stepped in. And you talk about a ground ball pitcher, Coney. He's been fantastic. And Perez and Heaney have been, you know, more solid uh, average to above average starters. Evaldi's been one of the best pickups in the game. And Gray's been fantastic. So I think that they do have enough pitching. I'm sure they will be very active come the deadline, but a couple things they have in their favor. One, a ridiculously good offense. So they're going to have more margin for error built in anyway, and wins in the bank. They're 40 and 20. And you say, well, you can, they're not running away with the division, but one thing they do have in their corner is these wins in the bank. If they go 500 the rest of the season, that's 91 and 71, which would almost certainly get you into the, into the postseason. But they look like that they're going to be well over 500 for the uh, for the foreseeable future. So good for the Rangers to turn this thing around. Yeah, I think Texas had the proactive mindset the last two off seasons in terms of building itself into a, a quick contender. I think they're going to continue to have that mindset in terms of shopping for pitching. They're not going to be afraid to to swing a deal here as as trade season heats up and a lot of the players that they you know hedge their bets on it's largely panned out so far at their 20 games over 500. It just, you know, really stinks that the the one that didn't uh, at this point is obviously the most talented pitcher in the game when he's healthy and on the, on, on the mound five years for to 185 million as a, uh, a 34, 35 year old. I know that raised some eyebrows, even though for, for Jacob to in the end, they're going to have him for about three and a half seasons 
if all uh, goes to plan after his his Tommy John surgery. People, this summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well. Reach your goals with delicious calorie smart and protein smart lunch and dinner options, plus new vegan recipes as well. It is all about portion control if you want that nice summer body, but you don't have to make yourself a prisoner of your own kitchen. You can continue to eat delicious food in a smart way. HelloFresh is one of the big reasons why you're able to do that. Their seasonal ingredients are picked at peak ripeness. They travel from the farm right to your doorstep in less than seven days for that fresh flavor in every single bite. And the variety is just second to none. HelloFresh delivers mouthwatering, chef crafted recipes and fresh ingredients to your door so you can spend less time meal planning and prepping here. I, I, for me, cooking is very therapeutic, but this cuts out a lot of the steps, saves me a bunch of time when I'm really needing to get uh, on the go there and, and get to the ballpark so I can cut the steps out. The kit is ready to roll and I have a fresh, awesome meal that is healthy in less than an hour of, of actual prep time. Here's the way that you can get in on the action. Go to HelloFresh.com slash slab16 and use code slab16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash slab16, S-L-A-B-1-6, and start using America's number one meal kit today. The Blue Jays are dealing with some pitching depth issues on top of arguably their most talented starter really struggling here in 2023. And it got to the point where Toronto announced that they had its option Alec Manoa to the Florida Complex League on Tuesday. Uh, Manoa's 1-7 this season with an ERA of 6-3-6 in 13 starts. So nearly half the amount of starts that a pitcher typically averages in a given season. Manoa was, was really supposed to lead this rotation as he uh, he's finished third in Cy Young voting last year, it's kind of been the complete opposite. So, what is next for Alec Manoa, guys? Well, I you know I I think it's the right move rather than send him down to AAA or AA or whatever and try to put him in a rotation to con continue to pitch uh, as part of a regular spot. Push the reboot button, send him to the Florida Complex, and have a complete evaluation biomechanically speaking. And that's probably the best place to do it. Most spring training sites now have all the equipment, all the tools, all the toys to be able to do these kind, this kind of analysis. And that's really what he needs. He needs one-on-one -on -one sort of a look, his organizational pitching coaches. He can have all the resources he needs to kind of rebuild everything. And that's what needs to be looked at here is if you break down his mechanics, there's, there's something different going on there. His slider has lost almost three inches of horizontal movement on it. The quality of the pitch has really gone downhill. That's his signature pitch. The release point looks like it's a little bit off in terms of biomechanics. And, and when you measure the release point, according to baseball savant, uh, these organizations have much more information than we have publicly speaking. So that's what he needs. He needs to get sort of in the garage and have a complete overhaul, a complete look at biomechanically what he's doing. Is there some weakness there? Does he need some strength training? Is, is part of these are part of these mechanical issues because he's a little bit broken down or a little bit fatigued in his shoulder area. That's what needs to be looked at top to bottom conditioning, uh, overall uh, health, and then a breakdown of his mechanics and how to get him back. And the way to do that is in the Florida complex, one-on-one -on -one instruction, no stress, no eyeballs on him, just kind of a uh, put him in the garage, close the garage door and go to work. The Blue Jays hope that this is a, a, a new age, uh, modern version of Roy Halladay, right? Where he was about as, as bad as any pitcher had been ever. And back to the drawing board, working with Mel Queen at the time, and he comes back as, as a Hall of Famer. Now, that's a very pat, tidy little story that uh, a little fairy tale that you can tell uh, pitchers, but it's, it's going to take a lot of work. But Dunedin is the place to be whether it's Dunedin with the Blue Jays, Tampa with the Yankees, all most of these teams now have very advanced uh, the garage, as, as you would say, as, as you as you called it, Coney, get in there, full diagnostic, tear down, build back up. It's the place for him to be. It's going to be a long process. And as for the Blue Jays team operating 
without Alec Manoa, many, many said, well, who do they have in his place? Yeah, the depth has always been a question with Toronto on each side of the ball, but mainly with their pitching staff. Well, you really can't do much worse than what Manoa had been giving you over those 13 starts. So it's obviously something that is, uh, a, you know, the, the cost benefit of just getting Manoa away from the team, get him into the garage, lock that puppy up. Hopefully he can figure it out, get back to Toronto and provide what was expected of him at some point here in uh, in 2023. All right, let's get to our chat with Tanner Swanson here. He uh, joined the Yankees uh, near the end of, of 2019, came over from the Twins, but his story is pretty cool. I mean, this was a this was a health education teacher in high school back in Washington State uh, before he advanced to uh, the pro ball coaching ranks. And some of his philosophies have kind of spread a little bit here in Major League Baseball. So we touch in on that. We touch about the new rules. Uh, we also get uh, into uh, some good stories with uh, him and his father's uh, his his father's bar in Seattle in the old days near the Kingdoms. Uh, Tanner's, you know, a, a resident of, of Washington State, the Seattle area. So a lot to tackle with the Yankees quality control and catching coach. Tanner Swanson is our guest this week on Tone the Slab, pitching with David Cohn. Tanner, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, we appreciate the the scenic view that you've provided us of the uh, the Upper East Side and the Harlem River here. Uh, we so we we have two months now of of data with the uh, new rules in effect across Major League Baseball. What have you and the staff learned with how they are affecting catchers and how they're working with pitchers here? Um, I th- I think the probably the first thing to, that stands out is is just how efficient our guys need to be with the from a decision making process right the, the window uh, between pitches has been condensed um, and, and I think maybe for the better right aside from just the shortening games and, and so forth but uh, I think previously there was a lot of time to, to mull over decisions and maybe overanalyze you know which pitch we, we needed to go with and, um, in a particular matchup so um, I, I think that process has had to really become more efficient. We've, we've, we've done a lot of work behind the scenes to try to streamline that content um, and, and simplify, um, like we talked about a little bit before, uh, before we started the call here. But I, I think that has probably stood out the most in terms of, you know, giving guys the information they need to, to be able to make quick um, decisions, um, pitch to pitch. Um, Learning just kind of the game tempo, right? Was a there's a new rhythm to the game that I think there was an adjustment period that that took some time to to figure out how to not necessarily manipulate the rules, but but find ways to to give guys a blow if they need to um, when we need need to make a big pitch, um, how we can stall or delay, and and just kind of some of the nuance within the rules to um, to try to you know, in certain situations, um, you know, give our pitcher the the best opportunity to, to be able to execute a pitch and, and maybe get us through an inning. So um, those things stand out. Obviously, the running game is, is um, has been impacted with the new rules, and, and there's certainly a, an emphasis or an advantage to the runner. Um, so that's, that's been something that we've had to attempt to combat and with, with various picks and holds and um, maybe new strategies in terms of where we're trying to target throws um, just to try to mitigate um, kind of the inevitable advantage that is kind of shifted towards the runner. You, know, you mentioned the, the targeting of the throws and we're seeing that across the league. I think something that Susan Waldman and I were talking about on the radio broadcast, everything, every throw feels like it's targeted uh, just to the right of, of second base. Um, and it's a big reason, I think, why you're seeing a lot of throws from catchers sail into center field. But so, why does that uh, position work so well? What 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 is that telling you guys? Yeah, uh, good observation on your guys' part. I mean, it's it's certainly intentional. Um, you know, like everything else, we have kind of data uh, to to kind of support or or learn more about kind of where outs are actually being recorded, um, and they're in most cases, not directly over the base, which is a little counterintuitive. Um, you know, now with the distance being with the larger bases, the, the distance is uh, between bases is shorter, right? And so, um, 
trying to kind of cut down the amount of time the ball is actually in the air, you know, the further to the right that, that throw um, is, is the shorter the distance, right? It arrives to the, the middle infielder sooner. Um, and so you, we can only do so much to, to try to increase arm strength. You know, our catcher's arms at this point kind of are what they are. Um, you know, we've, we've probably chewed off all the meat on the bone in terms of being as, as quick as possible to, you know, getting the ball out of our hands. So the only other area that, that we've targeted in terms of trying to uh, make up some ground is, is, you know, can we cut down the throw time? Can we get, how can we get the ball there uh, to second base faster? Um, and so targeting slightly up the line, like, like you, like you mentioned is, is something I don't, I don't think uh, we're the only organization that's, that's on that trail. I think you're, you're seeing that kind of throughout the league that a lot of throws uh, are being targeted just to the right of second base and, and I think the other thing that it does that's that's really valuable is it's it's reducing the the tag time, right? The the amount of time it takes for the middle infielder to actually catch the ball and then apply the tag. Um, you know, now with with instant replay, you know, back in the day, if the ball beat the runner, you know, it was it was usually ruled out, and and that's simply not the case anymore. You you physically have to apply a tag. Um, so it doesn't matter if we're tagging the hands, the you know, the shoulder, the back, the feet, the helmet. Um, as long as the tag is happening before contact with the base, um, you know, the, you know, we will record an out with, with replay. So, um, so with all that said, I think it's, yes, you're, you're right. There's a little bit more risk in terms of balls getting away from the infielders. Um, but it is a skill that, you know, that, that we practice. It's, it's something that our middle infielders are aware of, you know, they're encouraging our, our catchers to, to deliver the ball there for all the reasons I described. So it's, it's a collected, uh, collective effort, um, you know, but it does come with more risk. I mean, if we, we could deliver the, the quote unquote perfect throw chest high at the base, but if the runner's safe, um, you know, it may look aesthetically pleasing on TV, but um, we're, we're, we're searching for outs and, and trying to find any edge we can to, um, to win on the margin. So this, this is certainly one of, one of those, you know, Tanner, I think uh, that to me, I think your story personally, and I'd like just to give you a chance to, to give you a little bit of your background, but I know you, uh, you know, you kind of jumped into the Minnesota Twins organization out of Santa Clara and, you know, you, you're a trailblazer. I mean, you kind of, you, I'm sure you've met a lot of resistance from the old schoolers. You can't catch on one knee guys and all the innovative stuff you brought to the Yankees and really to the twins with, with, with the work you did there, uh, you know, I, how did you get to where you are? How did you bust through and become sort of this this innovator and this this new school, uh, you know, uh, style of catching that is, has really taken hold now and is really, I mean, it's it's not it's not new school anymore, right? I mean, you see catchers all across the both leagues now catching on one knee and and using everything that you brought to the Yankees. How did how did you come across this? How did you develop? And how did you get your break with the Twins initially? Um, you know. It certainly wasn't uh, calculated. You know, I had no ambitions of coaching in the big leagues. I, I never thought that, that would was a possibility. You know, previously, if, if you didn't play at that level, it was it was really hard to uh, establish a career um, as a coach. Um, so I, I kind of had my my head set on college baseball. I was happy. I spent you know four or five years at the University of Washington, and then a short stint at Santa Clara. Um, and, and I wasn't a catcher as a, I was a mediocre college player, division two infielder. And, um, but when I started coaching at the university of Washington, I got tasked with, with coaching the catchers, which I had very little experience. And, and so I think I got, I got to look at it from a, maybe a different perspective. Um, I got to maybe ask questions that other people weren't asking, maybe dumb questions uh, on the surface, but, um, I, I didn't carry a lot of bias in terms of this is how I used to do it. This is what my, my coaches taught me. Um, so I kind of start with a clean slate and, and just became obsessed with, with trying to um, figure out the details of the position, you know, what were the problems, what are things maybe the industry is missing, um, and just kind of went on this journey and not to, by no means to be kind of the contrarian and to, to fight upstream to, to try to change the, the system or how we were the catchers were, were doing things, but um, you know, professional baseball really opened my eyes to uh, now I had access to all this data and information and I could, I could look at it really objectively. And um, 
just kind of identified a problem. I think you know that that stemmed around the stances and positions that that catchers were in, and um, which was you know we knew that framing was was really important. This is you know this is five to ten years ago. It, you know that was that was no secret. Um, it was it was becoming prominent. Organizations were uh, really trying to optimize it, and whether that was through acquisition or um, development, whatever, we, we knew that there was value in, in being able to add strikes. Um, you know, so when, when I started digging into the data, it really started with, okay, let's, what are catchers? Um, let's, let's look at what catchers, what their skill level is in, in this regard uh, with the absence of blocking and throwing. So it, it started by looking at, you know, this is empty, less than two strikes. There's no other influence that, that catchers have to worry about. You know, and I, I kind of use that as the baseline to identify, okay, this is their true talent. Um, and then compared that to, um, you know, what their receiving metrics looked like, you know, w- when you added the influence of blocking or throwing. So we add a base runner, you know, what does it look like in two strike counts? And across the league, universally, uh, universally catchers regress. They're, they're receiving metrics almost, um, you know, league-wide, everybody got worse. And, and so that was interesting to me and, and, that just led to more questions and, and, and the biggest difference amongst those two base states is the, the positions that catchers would get into, right? They'd be in this deep, relaxed squat with, with the bases empty. And then, and, and now we need to block or throw and, and they're in a completely different position. Um, and so that was kind of the, I thought the, the first kind of aha moment that said, well, if, if, if receiving is so important, this, this skill is so valuable, um, you know, and, and catchers are so much better, you know, in this relaxed, deep squat. Well, why don't we just, why aren't we in this position uh, exclusively, right? Why are we in this, this alternative position, ready to block, ready to throw, when, when still in those base states, those outcomes are still pretty rare, right? You're, you're in this secondary stance for 50% of the game, and you might block three or four balls um, and still receive, you know, 50 to 60 and, and maybe make one throw. Um, throughout the course of, of the game. So the just the economy in, in terms of how catchers were using stances um, interest me. Um, and then that just led to a lot of experimentation in the minor leagues, which which I think, um, you know, the low, lower level of minor leagues is, is great for um, being able to try new things. I, I was in an organization that really encouraged um, that kind of trial and error process. And, and so we just started playing around with different positions and and, and, and a lot of this was, you know, this wasn't new necessarily. Um, you know, the, there, were, there were catchers in the, the 70s and 80s and, and throughout who would, I think, intuitively get in these knee down positions. Um, and, and I wouldn't say just because they were maybe more comfortable, but I think intuitively it helped them, you know, catch the ball near yeah, the bottom Tony, of the strike Tony zone. Tony Pena, Benito They're Santiago. Yeah, yeah. E- exactly. These, these guys were doing this previously, and for some reason – um, it got kind of ostracized and it, it went away and, and you saw fewer and fewer catchers utilizing those stances and, and given those were only, you know, in those bases empty, less than two strike base states. And, um, so I, I, I just, we, we, we started measuring, like we, we started playing around with those same setups. Um, and, and I had a baseline from the, the, the year previous, you know, when I, when I first got to Minnesota, no catchers were in our organization were utilizing those stances, so we had kind of baseline um, metrics on what they wore previously, and then we we put them all in knee down stances, different variations, and we and we saw progress, you know, almost across every catcher um, better. And that was again just with nobody on base, and and so it was it became pretty clear quickly that these positions were more advantageous. And then the next question was, well, can we learn to block and throw from these positions? Um, and that was kind of the next step is to. Um, and, and everybody surrounding me was, you know, told me at the time that you, it wasn't possible. And, and, you know, the question I asked myself was, well, has anybody really, really given this a shot? Has anybody really tried? Um, and so we did. And, and not only did we learn that you could block and throw from these positions that we learned that maybe they were actually better blocking positions. And I think now over time, the data is kind of shaken out. And, and I can't say that I knew that going into it. Uh, I actually kind of was, was in the belief that, Hey, if the receiving gets exponentially better, but the blocking and throwing takes a slight hit, that, that still might be a net win in terms of run per 
mentioned, that was kind of my mindset um, going into it. Um, but, you know, quickly that shifted. And, and we, once I started seeing catchers block from these positions and we started playing around with nuance to, to be able to actually move more efficiently and um, still while, while prioritizing uh, the, re the receiving component, um, you know, it's, I think, now it's 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 becoming difficult to dispute as as the almost the entire league now has kind of adopted this this style. So I think there was a little bit of luck involved, a little bit of timing in terms of um, professional baseball being ready to kind of welcome somebody like myself who who didn't have that um, extensive playing background, um, and then being in an organization that that kind of encouraged uh, that kind of exploration. Um, and trial and error and, and I think it was kind of the, the merge of those two things coming together and um, a little bit of luck along the way yeah what, that's what the you, biggest go ahead go, go ahead James yeah no, I was saying I just think the biggest misconception around this is the idea that well if you do go down on one knee or any of these newer methods that it it hurts you in all these other ways but as we've seen if you pool catchers who are traditional stance catchers who are one knee down stance and you compare the groups blocking metrics framing metrics throwing uh numbers that it isn't a a big detriment to the rest of your game but you can still help yourself in the receiving end so i think that that's one way that teams have embraced this because contrary to popular opinion it doesn't kill you it doesn't prevent you from blocking a ball in the dirt either no it's again again against conventional wisdom it actually helps you and i think you're right that is the, the biggest misconception if 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 the net outcome wasn't you know more runs prevented then teams wouldn't and organizations wouldn't be scaling this this method you know across their entire systems and certainly wouldn't be letting guys do this at the major league level where we know we know how much money is at stake so it, it's not solely about stealing strikes and um, the, the blocking piece, you know, there's, there's this year. And if you include last year, I think we're on pace to, you know, there's fewer wild pitches and pass balls per pitch thrown in our game currently 2023 and 2022 than any other year on record. I mean, so the, the notion that catch that catchers are chasing balls to the backstop left and right because of, uh, because their knee is grounded is it's, it's just not accurate. Um, you know, catchers are, preventing 90 feet maybe at a better rate than we ever have and across the entire industry. And, and some of that you could argue maybe it's pitch calm. There's fewer cross-ups. It's, it's certainly not solely related to the, the, the new setups, but um, I think it's just, it's inaccurate to say that, you know, we're doing a poor job as an industry, you know, uh, securing the baseball and preventing runner advancements. I think catchers across the industry are, are doing um, as, as good a job as we ever have. So I, I think you're right. There's, there's a lot of misconception around uh, what's really taking place. Yeah. Well, you know, some of the techniques, you know, that, that, I, that we've seen, and I think as a direct result of, you know, what you're teaching as well is, you know, to block from the grounded position from your knee grounded. I mean, I'm seeing more handwork, right. Some, some guys on the short hops. I mean, it's, it's so hard to predict, especially on those short hops to kind of throw your body and try to get into a block position as opposed to using those great hands. Right. I've, I've seen some picks on short hops that seem to be very effective as well. Is that something that you've, you zeroed in on in terms of technique or. It's, it's something that we practice. I think um, I, a couple of things I think at play here where, where, you know, the receiving has become so prevalent, right. That, that, that catchers who don't possess this skill anymore um, unless they can really, really hit, you know, you're just seeing fewer and fewer catchers who lack this, this ability. So naturally they're, you know, catchers are moving through systems and, and being promoted to the big leagues or acquired because they have really good hands. They have good glove skill. Um, we're just more aware of, of the value that catchers bring from a receiving standpoint. So there's been a greater emphasis on acquiring those types of players, um, training you know that's that particular skill um and then and then letting them utilize those good hands those that that elite glove skill you know we have more motor control over our hands than any other part of our body and i think for a long time it was taboo to 
to let catchers use those hands to, to block. It was, it was, you had to, had to get your chest on everything. And, um, and so I, I think a lot of the best blockers in the league, this was an observation I, I kind of stumbled on along the way. Like I, 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 I wanted to know who were the best blockers and, and I watched them and studied them intently. And a lot of those guys use their gloves. They pick a lot, you know, the Thomas Nito's of the world, like picks mm-hmm. everything. And is one of the best blockers in all of baseball, Jose Trevino, like if it's, if it squares him up, he's, he's really efficient at getting the ball to his belly button. But if it's outside his body slightly, um, you know, he picks it and he, and he does it at a really, really efficient rate, probably more efficient than, you know, than otherwise than, and trying to body something and then have to recover it, um, get the ball to your hand. I mean, if once a ball is picked, um, like there's no opportunity to advance. I mean, it, it really kills the base runner's instincts to be able to, to try to advance on dirt balls. And, um, so it, it just, but it's something you have to train. It's, it's not, it's not lazy. It's, it's not because we're in bad positions. It's, it's actually something we're really intentional about. Um, and, and just if, if nothing else, if given our catchers the freedom to, to not rely on, but to use as a tool, uh, if or when needed. Tanner, I love that you are, you're, you're outside right now. I think you have the loudest bird sitting on the picnic bench with you right now. (laughs) Um, It's awesome. (laughs) Uh, Because receiving is so prevalent, I wanted to do a quick exercise here with you. Um, Without being able to name your own catchers here, give us your top three receiving catchers in the game right now. Um, uh, The the guys in Pittsburgh are – killing it the uh, jason delay austin hedges uh, those two guys are up there um william Contreras is having a really good year I, I think he's he's made a big jump and they've done a really good job with him um in milwaukee um yeah those those three stand out to me well i'll jump in and say i have the stat cast leaderboard right in front of me and those three guys are all in the top eight and it's a little bit of cheating because you're not allowed to pick your own guys jose trevino the leader in the major leagues last year and he's right up there with the leaders again this year. Yeah, I, I probably look at those leaderboards too often. So <laughs> well, you guys, you guys have your own proprietary metrics too, in terms of uh, even more extensive than we see on Statcast. I know every organization does. Yeah, we do. Uh, anything, anything you can tell me is it count specific or things you prioritize at the position in terms of framing or anything else? When you evaluate a catcher the next day, you know what, what are the first things you look at or you prioritize? Um. Yeah, so we, we, we do have our own system. I'm, I'm not sure how much it varies from the from the public site. Um, it, it is count specific. You know, the, the strike zone is a, a living, breathing thing that um, that changes by the count. It's so we're, we're not using the standard rule book strike zone. We're, we're actually using um, very specific uh, umpire, you know, uh, strike zone. What is this this particular umpire? Um, where What is his zone? And when we have enough historical data to be able to know that okay this guy gives this much down he gives this much in doesn't give away um and so we actually can form a a a strike zone for that particular umpire and and then we evaluate our catchers uh you know based on whether we gained or lost strikes within uh you know that environment you know with that particular umpire um and, and there's we we include the pitcher the batter you know they all have reputations um you know, the Brett Gardner's of the world would, would potentially have a smaller strike zone, right? Just because, of, you know, they could intimidate umpires and um, the Aaron judges, uh, judges of the world because of his physique, like, you know, has a larger strike zone. So we, we can, we can factor in, you know, the hitters and, and same thing with pitchers. There's, there's pitchers who can bully umpires. And, um, and even though some of that I think is, is uh, less prominent than maybe it was, once was just because I think umpires are held more accountable to the actual strike zone as opposed to, you know, giving the veteran player uh, a little bit more rope and, and squeezing the rookie. And, and I think there's less of that going on um, just because, like I said, these, these umpires are being graded. They're being evaluated based on uh, the strike zone and how accurate they are within it. So, um, so anyway, there's a, there's a lot that goes into, um, you know, our, our strike probability models that, that kind of uh, ultimately you know, spits out a report and, um, so we, we look at that with the catchers, we, we know where they gain and where they lose strikes. And, and we look for trends in terms of, you know, are there particular parts of the zone we're losing strikes? Um, and, and then we look at the movement quality, 
okay, what, what is the load like in terms of where is the, the glove hide at pitch release and uh, maybe how, how quick or how late was the move, um, you know, how efficient was it in terms of its directness to the pitch and what was the, the post-catch move direction, you know, was it a more vertical move versus a horizontal move? And, and we know uh, which of all of those things, you know, are, are more advantageous or less advantageous for gaining or losing strikes. So, uh, it's it's much more uh, than just the stance, you know, and and when we're kind of well beyond uh, that part of it, and, and really digging deeper in terms of the quality of the catch. Um, and, and we have data and metrics to kind of look at that objectively, and we compare that to other players throughout the league who really excel at in certain parts of the strike zone. So we're we're, we're digging pretty deep and um, trying to uncover every rock and find any edge the margins have only gotten smaller and smaller with you know I think catchers throughout the league are getting really really good at this skill um, so it's becoming harder and harder to separate so we're, we're trying to stay ahead and um, you know dig and, and look at as, as much nuance as possible to uh, to try to find an advantage do you feel vindication now at this point considering all the brushback you got when you first started especially from old schoolers and kind of continues a little bit to today, you know, and especially with blocking and there's still, I hear one on a broadcast every now and then in old schoolers, I see he's down on one knee. See that, that pass ball. I mean, you've got the data to back it up now. I mean, you're well established. You see it across the league. Everything's been, you know, the proof's in the pudding, right? I mean, everybody's doing it. They wouldn't be doing it if it didn't work. Do you, do you feel it's okay to, it's okay to take a victory lap, right? Do you, do you feel like, uh, I, you know, I you, really don't. No, I really don't. <laughs> to be honest, like the, the criticism is always louder than the praise. So I, I still listen too often to, you know, and it, it and I take it, I take it too personal. I'm, I'm maybe too immature. Um, but I think that's natural, man. I think yeah, it's absolutely. natural for everyone and whatever walk of life they're in. Yeah. So, it, but it, yes, to, to some degree that it's, you know, to, to see how uh, quickly it's, it's been adopted throughout the league, you know, there's, there's some definitely some validation there. And, um, but, at the same time, it's what have you done for me lately? And we're trying to move on and figure out what, what the next thing is. Um, so no, no time for a victory lap. Yeah, like, okay. Now the most important topic, Swanee's bar in Seattle. I mean, you, people, <laughs> people don't, you know, maybe people need to hear the, the history with your father and the league. And I certainly spent some time there. Everybody that's come through Seattle over the years certainly has met, met there at one point in time, you know, met your family, met your pops. Uh, you know, there's a lot of history there. I know some of those stories we can't tell, yeah. but, right. uh, you know, you, you know, it, it is an interesting kind of family, uh, uh, matter there that, that people, people might not understand. So, uh, what, what, uh, what can you tell us about it? Uh, it, it is, it's, it is kind of a cool story. You know, my dad was a, a left-handed catcher. So maybe I was like bred for this, uh, unconventional path in terms of the catching world. And, <laughs> you know, he, he, pl he played for this, independent uh, professional team out of Portland, the Portland Mavericks. Um, like I said, he was left-handed. He, he caught Jim Bouton. And there's a lot of really cool, unique stories from, from, from that team. And, and, and so he, he, he kind of carried that, uh, that persona uh, to Seattle with him and opened up a bar in the, you know, in the early eighties. And it became kind of a hot spot for, for players. It was two blocks from the kingdom. Um, so my whole childhood, I, you know, I spent, I, I like to say I grew up in a, you know, in a sports bar and um, sitting at the side table, you know, um, while my dad worked and when I visited him on the weekend. So, but everybody I, went I, through I, that. I the whole players. league, the whole league went through there. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I've heard stories my entire life, uh, you know, about the Coney's and the good reason <laughs> and, there was there was always this uh, thing with the Yankees. To be honest, I don't know what it was. Uh, it seemed more so than uh, than other clubs. Um, but I always heard Yankee stories, and every time the Yankees were in town, we had tickets and and we were we'd go to the games. And um, so yeah, it's 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 a fun time. Um, I, I love reconnecting with guys like Coney and, and making that connection. Um, and and some of the it, it's fun to see the face, <laughs> to see the expression when I when I, when I make that connection that, yes. yeah, that was, that was my dad's place. And to watch them, watch people like Coney get nervous and okay, what does this guy know? <laughs> <laughs> you know where the bodies are buried. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's been fun. 
Tanner, what's what's the coolest memory you have with a former big leaguer from from being in your your father's establishment? Uh, this one wasn't personal, uh, but it's it's definitely a vivid memory, and um, you know, maybe maybe one I shouldn't share on here. It's it's not it's not horrible, but um, I remember my dad ran a promotion for uh, it was for Dave Valley's. They were selling well drinks for for Dave Valley's batting average, you know, and this is when he was the catcher in Seattle, and and uh, I, I remember going to the Kingdom, and you know, and they weren't very good at the time, and so there weren't a lot of fans. Um, and he would get out and, and the stadium would cheer, you know, that this is their, their own player. And, and, and it, it caught media buzz and uh, Dave Valley, I'm sure is not happy about it. And not a fan of my father. And maybe that's why he's not a fan of me down setups now. I'm, I'm not sure. he's, he's still a critic, isn't he? Yeah. So I, I don't know if he's made that connection and I obviously have nothing personal. Uh, I mean, I actually respect Dave a lot um, for what he's, he's done in the game, but, that's that's a vivid memory just uh you know that that promotion and 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 how it kind of caught media's attention and and became a a thing that was buzzing in the city that's excellent excellent stuff tanner thanks so much for uh for taking some time with us here we love what you're doing uh with all the catchers behind the plate receiving has become the focal point of the position and uh under your guidance the yankees are are doing it better than most here so we uh we thank you here. Pick it. Pick Thanks. that. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. You got it, Thanks, Tanner. Justin. Appreciate thank you. appreciate you guys. Love Take the care. show. Take care. See you guys. All right, David. From uh from a player's perspective, give us the uh, description of this uh, establishment in downtown Seattle during your playing days. Was this like a dive bar, a hole in the wall? What what do we have going on here? Probably closer to a hole in the wall, more an old school sports bar, but it was two blocks from the King Dome. So a lot of players around the, around the league, really the American league back then would go straight from the clubhouse. You'd shower up and Hey, we, let's go meet a Swanee. So that was the spot. It was, you know, you didn't have to take the team bus if you didn't want to, you could go drown your sorrow. You had a tough game. You'd go right to Swanee's or if you had a great game, you could go right to Swanee's, but it was a gathering point. Uh, I remember hanging out with Dave Henderson there, the late great Dave H- Hindu uh, was a great outfielder for a lot of different teams, including Seattle. He lived in the area and he was always a guy that would be there, you know, and you could always catch up with Hindu. There it was one of the great characters of all time. So the, the stories go on and on, um, you know, Swanee's father, of course, uh, uh, the, you know, Tanner hanging out there as a kid, as a, as a young, young man. And certainly that was a big influence in his life. I'm sure seeing the stories and, you know, it was, it was really just about war stories, really, you know, it's like a, a Bruce Springsteen song, right? Glory days. I mean, that's, that's where we all gathered. We all, we all talked our talk and it was a safe place. That was the thing that everybody, you know, when you, when, and whenever you get big liquors hanging out in a, in a place like that, you feel safe. You feel like you can let your hair down. You can talk a little bit and, you know, uh, you, you, nobody, nobody's going to know, you know, you're going to be protected there. And that, that was the kind of place it was. Those are the places that we all wish we had on our list of uh, re- reliable settings uh, in any city we visit, but mainly in our in our own neighborhood. People, more Tone the Slab is coming up, but first I need to tell you about how you can hit it out of the park this baseball season with DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers can place a $5 bet and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, all customers can take a shot at bigger payouts with DraftKings stepped-up same-game parlays. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, sign up with code SLAB, that's S-L-A-B, and new customers can bet just 5 bucks and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code SLAB only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 800 327 Five zero five zero, or visit gamblinghelplinema.org. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Kansas, call 1-800-522-4700. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 or plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Opt in and 10 plus leg requirement for 100% boost. Eligibility, wagering, and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash baseball terms. All right, let's get to some Yankees chat, guys. Um, we, we talked about Aaron Judge missing some time. Let's dive deeper into the outfield situation here. Uh, you know, on one hand, you're like, well, how can they be, 
you know, how, how can they be uh, as competitive without a guy like Aaron Judge? Obviously, a star, their best player. And all, some a lot of people say, well, look what we're w- left with here. This is an organizational failure on the part of the Yankees. Well, it really it, it's tough to say that when you do have three, four outfielders on the injured list all at once. It's it's tough for any organization to make up all those losses. But in the present moment, we are left with guys like Connor Falefa and Bowers and Calhoun, Oswaldo Cabrera, Stanton eventually when he's not just DHing. What can be done in the present moment to improve the Yankees outfield situation? It, it all has to be in, internal at this point. There, there, there's there might be a couple of scrap heap guys that might have minor league options or op- opt outs in their minor league deals. There might be a couple of guys worth looking at, you know, but I'm not sure there, that there's anybody out there that's, that's any better than what they have in AAA, whether it's Franchi Cordero or Estevan Floreal, probably Cordero. He's already on the roster. You could probably call him right back up. It's probably the easiest maneuver right now, but yeah, I think you go back to spring training and you look at the outfield depth. And the Yankees made bets. They made bet. They made a bet on Jake Bowers and had him in AAA, and he's kind of paid off. Really, that was a big, big game he had in LA. His his numbers overall are well above average. Going to see more of him. Willie Calhoun has been much better as of late. He's a tough out. He's a p machine. Hits line drives everywhere. Willie Calhoun does, and so you know it's, it's that's what's going to have to be done internally. And, and and wait for Harrison Bader to get back. That that's a big piece as well that could be back within a week or so. Uh, but that's it. You you you're, you're going to score less runs. There's just no two ways about it. Without Aaron Judge in the lineup, you're going to score less runs because he is that good. And that puts the emphasis on defense, on on all the little things, on allowing fewer runs, on continuing to pitch well uh, on the Yankee side. And their bullpen has been great up to now. It's going to have to keep keep on keeping on and and win some close games. They lost one three to two last night. They need to be on the other end of those kind of games and win some three to twos until Judge gets back. Get Harrison Bader back. I think that's number one on the list. It's a short-term injury, so if you're trading water for a few games and then Bader gets back soon, that's one less thing to worry about. Bowers, you brought it up, Coney, 127 OPS+, plus, which is uh, 27% better than league average and probably more than anyone could have hoped for. And so that's that's one thing. If you have one question mark in the outfield, that's not a big deal. But when you have that and then – two guys that you were banking on judge and Bader, then they go down at the same time. You're going to be up against it, but long-term Aaron judge, Harrison Bader locked in Giancarlo Stanton. If whatever he gives you in the outfield is gravy, either that, or he's locking down the DH spot, holding it down there. So I think it's, it is just a, it's something that you just have to have blow over and get production from other spots. Yeah. This is just another point in the season where you, you, you have to, for the river, to, to borrow an old phrase from Oregon Trail. People of a certain age know what I'm talking about there. Uh, but but weather the storm, obviously, and like David said, other areas of the team, not specifically just the hitting, uh, need to step it up. Run prevention is underscored in situations like this. And that kind of leads me to maybe my next question for you guys. Talking about the pitching, getting back to our bread and butter here with this this Yankees starting rotation now down Nestor Cortez with some shoulder issues. Hopefully, it uh, you know just some some downtime will kind of revamp and re-energize that shoulder. And you take a look at the supporting cast, I guess behind Garrett Cole, it's always the big question mark. I see a guy like Clark Schmidt who was on the mound on Tuesday night, looked pretty good, registered a quality start. Last four appearances, he has a 2.49 earned run average. Are we starting to see a young pitcher in Clark Schmidt maybe turn the corner in the rotation? I say yes. The quality of his pitches has been measurably better by any metrics you want to use. You know, he's always had kind of a He's always been rather a darling of the analytics community because he possesses such high spin rate, such such stuff, stuff plus. If you rate his pitches, boy, that they're really the potential. You could see it there, the sharpness of the break on all of his breaking pitches, and from his knuckle curve to his cutter to his sweeper. You know, they're all high quality, high spin pitches. So yes, the quality of his pitches have gotten better, and that includes location. So there's a lot of different ways to measure it, whether it's just pure stuff, you know, the movement profile. The command location plus is another stat uh, that, that that you can you break down pitchers on. All of them across the board have gotten better for Clark Schmidt. He's locating better. His stuff is sharper. 
it, it's still in terms of spin rate and and, and the, the the movement profile still among among the best in the league. So yes, if you look at his FIP, things he controls, a fielder independent pitching, it's down around the low fours, four point three two, much lower than his ERA. So he's trending in the right direction. He's gaining confidence. He's getting deeper into the games. And that was the worry early was God, it's a fourth inning. You've got to get a little bit more out of you. And now we are. Now he's getting through six innings. Now he's he's a threat to get deeper into the games. That to me is is the is the biggest improvement that his own confidence on the mounds allowing him to get deeper in the games and trust his stuff much more. When the ERA is at 6.30, it's going to take a while to get that down. So don't look at the season numbers for a little while, <laughs> but he is getting better every start. And even the loss to the White Sox, three runs in six innings. One was a short porch home run. One was a, a, a long home run, but well enough to win the game. If the Yankees offense does anything, if they get a hit for him, then it becomes, oh, wow, he really kept him in the game. He's been fantastic. The cutter has been better. That was such a problem pitch. It looked good in spring training, and then it just didn't translate in the first part of the season. But during this four-start stretch with the two-and-a-half ERA, batters four for 24 against the cutter. Everything's getting better. It's a, it's a long process. But Schmidt has looked a lot better, and they need it because with Nestor Cortez going down, that's a spot in the rotation that they need. You know, one indicator that the pitch quality is there, like we said, you know, with Schmidt, the raw stuff has has always been there. Uh, the, the the pitch quality, the pitch selection, he's going deeper and he's being efficient along the way. Last night uh, against the White Sox, he only needed 79 pitches to uh, to get through six innings. So good signs from Clark Schmidt. We'll see if uh, he can keep it up here, but definitely encouraging signs for a rotation that needs some at the moment. And we'll see what happens uh, down the road here. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, Coney, where are you at this Sunday night? Oh, right here. Uh, Red Sox Yankees going to be the back to back Sundays. We're going to be in New York, obviously, for the Red Sox Sunday night and then the following weekend in Boston. So back to back, you know, ESPN, they with the balanced schedule, they're, they're going to grab every Red Sox Yankees game they can. Right. <laughs> so even if it's back to back weekends, we're going we're to see we're going to see the old rivalry uh, spark back up. That's right. They're coming out at the premium. Uh, here in 2023, so you get back-to-back -back weeks of Yankees Red Sox on Sunday Night Baseball. Three straight weeks uh, for the Yankees on Sunday Night Baseball. So you know what that means? You get three straight off days uh, the following day on a Monday. So we all like that. <laughs> all right, guys, that's going to do it for this episode. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you do not miss a single thing of what we are streaming each and every week. For David Cohn, for James Smythe, for our outstanding producer, Dan Work, this is Justin Shackle. Big thank you to Yankees catching coach Tanner Swanson for joining us this week. We will talk to you next week on Tone of the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn, a production of John Boy Media. Take care.